Today, I, I want to uh, share God's word, so I want you to stand with me. We're going to read 1 John chapter 3, and we baptized in the first service two more people. 298 people have been baptized this year at Clover Hill. That's, that's good news. Here, here's God's word. Guess what? My iPad wasn't opening. Now it opened. Here it is. That's like my greatest fear, my zipper being down and my iPad not opening. <laughs> I don't know what's worse. Check them both all the time. (laughs) 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material... So John's talking about what does it mean to be born again? What does it look like? How do born again believers act? How do they live? How do they respond? There was a lot of questions on, have I lost my salvation? Am I still in fellowship with Jesus? And so John gives us some tests or some questions that we can answer to ensure that we're walking with God. And in this case, he talks about the love of Jesus, and then he, he turns it on, not turn it on us, but, but he, he gives us some instructions. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know we belong to truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. So if you want to know you're right with God, just don't love with words, but love with action and truth. If your hearts condemn us, we know God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. So dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask. Because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us, because we know it by the spirit that he gave us. Father, we thank you for your word. And again, I need you, Lord. Oh, I need you. We had a great first service, Lord, but I don't want to depend or rely on that. We need a fresh word this service, Lord. This is a new group of people. They've, they've, set, they've set aside their mourning. They've come to not hear from me, but to hear from the Lord. And I pray in Jesus' name that you'd help me to communicate your truth, your will, your desire, your heart. And may the word of God fall on good soil, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. Jesus is... He, he's in the midst of a group of people. Some were there because they were very much seeking. They were very much interested. They were investigating. Who is this guy who claims to be the son of God? Who is this guy that teaches with such power and performs such miracles? There were other people there that had already decided to follow Jesus. They were sold out. They were committed. They were all in. And then there was a bunch of religious people there. They hated him. They hated what he did. They hated what he stood for. They hated he healed on the Sabbath. They hated that that he claimed to be what he was. they, They hated that he hung out with sinners. They hated everything about him. And their desire was to trap him to get him to mess up on his words so so that they could use his words against him. And and one of these Pharisees said, hey, hey, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And, And what he was saying, what he was asking was, is it worse to covet are to curse. They had 600 commandments, all these made man rules and all these made man stuff that they had to, you had to wash your hands a certain way. You, you had to do, I mean, it's just crazy stuff. Is it worse to, to commit adultery or to steal? Is it worse to worship an idol or divorce your wife? And Jesus responds, you want to know what the most important thing is? Just love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and all the prophets hang on these two commands. Hey, quit getting boggled down in the weeds. Quit thinking about all this stuff, and just love God, and just love people. There, there, there's a question I get asked more than any other question. Here's the number one, uh, number one question. Can I lose my salvation? I don't know. People are all, but am I eternally secure? And and my thought is, I don't want to go into that doctrinally, but just practically, what kind of question is that? Like, why do you ask that? It's almost like, how far from God can I be and still be a child of God? How, how, 
you know, it's like, my, it's like I got an inheritance. One day I'm going to pass away and go be with Jesus. And each of my kids are going to get 50 bucks. That, that's, what, that's what they're going to get left. And it's like Tyler saying, Dad, well, if I burn down the house, are you still going to give me my inheritance? It's like Zach saying, Dad, if I dishonor mom and treat her with contempt, and I, am I still going to get my inheritance? Emily's saying, Dad, if I, don't, if I don't ever talk to you again, am I still going to get my inheritance? I'm like, what kind of question is that? We're in relationship. Why, why, why are we asking if we can lose our salvation? Why don't we ask how close can we get to Jesus? Why don't we quit thinking about how far to the edge can we still be and still be in relationship with God? And why can't we just say, how close to Jesus can we be? If we'll just love God and love people. When, when you love God, you desire to please him. You desire to honor him. You desire to get off the edge and get into the center of his will. When you love people, you want their, their best interests first. You, you honor them with words and actions. You, you want to please, you want to please God more than anything else. Jesus says, Hey, here's what it boggles down to. Just love God and love people. When you love God with all your heart, your mind, your, your, your desire will be to please him. You don't have to worry about everything else. And then John goes, love is exampled by Christ. That's what he gives us in our text today. This is how we know what love is. Okay, what is love? Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. You know, you've, you've heard it. I've heard it all my life. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. You want me to sing it? No, I'm not doing it. And it can get, it can get matter of fact. You, you don't, and I don't want God's love to get matter of fact. Like, like, it, like, like God loves us and he does have a plan and a purpose for our life. But you know, the significance of the word can get lost sometimes in its definition. And I've just, in the last few years, have started playing golf. It's because I can't play basketball anymore because my mind says go, but, but my body says no. And so I've picked up a golf. And, and here's how Webster defines golf, a game played on a large open air course in which a small hard ball is struck with a club into a series of small holes in the ground. And that don't sound a whole lot of fun to me. Like it loses its path. But here's what's fun. When you hit an 18 foot putt to save double bogey, that's like an amazing feeling. Like when you, you know, my, my ball has a, it just has, it loves water and it loves woods. Here's a great, here's a great feeling. When you hit your ball into the woods and you find your ball and you find 10 other balls at the same people. I went into the woods the other day to look for my ball and I always use bright colored balls because because I lose a lot of balls. And, and, and there was this little creek bed and it was running down and all these balls had got in the creek and what? And there was like 20 balls sitting there. I, Brian, I put them in my shirt. I put them in my pockets. It was like, let's go home. They once were lost, but now they're found. I'm done. Like golf is, it, it's amazing. There's nothing like playing golf with your older kids, with your adult children. They're not children anymore, with, with young men that we're, we're able to go and, and, to, and to talk. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. I love it. It, it doesn't matter how good. I, I, I just want you to know, this was my second, this was a par three. It was my, it was the shot off the tee box, six inches from the cups. Come on, somebody, that, that. That's the first time I've ever done that, probably the last time I've ever done that, but, but there's nothing like that. Here, here's one of them water holes. We were playing in Florida on vacation one time and my ball loves the water. It's in there somewhere. That's an alligator. I'm not going in there. They can have that ball. Like it's done. It's over. But you can't, you can't, you can't understand golf until you've experienced golf. You can't understand the love of God until you've experienced the love of God. Like it's not a definition that I can describe to you. In fact, Webster's defines it as a strong feeling of attraction resulting from sexual desire. That's what the world might define as love, but they've never experienced unconditional, self-sacrificing, never-ending love. They don't know what it's like to have their sins forgiven and to stand before God with a clear conscience and a pure heart. They don't know what it is to, have, to not have to worry about tomorrow and be sure of where you're going to spend eternity. They don't know what it is to have fellowship with God, to, to sense his presence 
and to hear his voice. You cannot know God's love until you experience it. The best definition that that Paul could come up with about God's love is in 1 Corinthians 13. And since God is love, God is patient and God is kind and he's not easily angered and he keeps no record of wrongs and he doesn't delight in evil. He rejoices with the truth. God always protects. God always trusts. He always hopes. He always perseveres. God never fails. Here's how John described it. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. And even in the description, it loses its meaning, it loses its impact, because you don't know it until you've experienced. But to lavish means to to bestow extravagantly. It's It's like our government's doing right now. Just passing out money. Just, they got it, don't have it, just keep making it. It's like, a, it's like a millionaire that's got thousands and thousands of dollars and the supply never ends. You want some more? Here, let me lavish it on you. It's a continual flow. It cannot be stopped. There's no, scarce, there's no scarcity of God's love. His love cannot be exhausted. It can't be depleted. It goes on and on and on. His love endures forever. Here's how Paul described it, but God demonstrated his love for us. And while we were sinners, he died. this is the love of God. Remember, he didn't just remove our sin. That wouldn't satisfy and justify the righteousness of God. No, he took the payment for our sin. He took my payment and put it on the back of Jesus. Jesus took the shame, the guilt, the punishment. He walked into a broken world and lived a perfect life and said, I'll be beaten for their transgressions. I'll be bruised for their iniquities. I'll be humiliated to bear their shame. I'll be tormented so they can have peace. I'll take everything on myself so they can be free. Jesus did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. We are made new. We're made right. We are declared righteous and holy. We are fully accepted, completely pardoned, mercifully forgiven. When Jesus said, it is finished, he meant it is finished. Sin's payment is satisfied. You don't owe the bill. You're not on an installment plan. That's the love. That's the mercy. That's the goodness of God. Don't be casual about the love of God. Don't let it get old. I I, I wish we could describe it better, but the songwriter said, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. It chases me down, fights till I'm found. It'll leave the 99. I don't deserve it. I couldn't earn it. Still, he gives himself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. The love of God was exampled by Jesus. And and then, then Paul goes, and that's what I want you to know. I want you to know how much God loves you. I wish I could explain it better. Paul even said, I wish you could understand the depth and the height and the breadth and, the, and the, the magnitude of God's love. I wish you could get a fresh revelation of it. That's my hope for us today. But when we do and when we know and, and when we've experienced God's love, what's the reciprocal? What's the, what, what happens now? Then we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Jesus is our model. Jesus is our example. He modeled what love's like. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Like you say you love me, shh. And I'm not preaching works. We don't earn the love of God by what we do. We do what we do because of the love of God. It's, it's, the, it's the byproduct of being loved by God. It's far by grace, and don't ever let me confuse you with a works-based gospel. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But yet, when we're born again, when we're saved, the next verse says, but we were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Because we're saved, we work. Because we're loved, we're lo- we love. Because we've been forgiven, we forgive. Because we receive, we freely give. And and, and you don't have, how can the love of God be in you? And here's the key verse I want to dig in for a minute. Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with action and truth. I've been reading through the gospels and I'm so challenged by the life of Jesus. And and I'm so convicted at times by the life of Jesus. And specifically when it comes to this, to this uh, loving Loving others, not just with words, but with actions. 
And in Matthew chapter nine, there's a, li- there's a day in the life of Jesus, and I, I wanna walk you through it in the next few moments. And I, I think it speaks to this, and it gives us, it, it knocks off some excuses that we might use to not do this, to love in action. And Jesus had just got done preaching uh, Matthew chapter eight. He's, he's been in ministry, he's tired, he's weary, he's exhausted. And he gets in a boat with his disciples and they head across the lake. And their goal is to get to the other side so they can get some rest, some relaxation, an opportunity to refuel and reconnect. And before he gets off the boat, before he can even put his foot on dry ground, a guy came up to him, some guys carrying a crippled fellow came up to him. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to, I want you to, don't just read it, but put yourself in it. Put yourself in the crowd today. Jesus just got off a boat. Cripple man, group of people. They, They beat him to the other side. And when he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic and those who carried him, guys, I'm exhausted. I'm so tired right now. Will you just come back later? And I know there's a big emphasis on self-care. And I'm not opposed to that. Like, that's why God's given us a Sabbath, so that we could refuel and reflect and realign ourselves with the heart of God. But I, I think some of us use this, I'm too tired, too much, and as an excuse not to love with action. Like, like I, I've been married to Angie now for 29 years, and, and I'm so blessed. She's the love of my life, my best friend. I'm so honored to... to to share life with her. And I look forward to the years that we're gonna be together. But I just can't say it with my mouth. I just can't say I love you and even express it publicly from a platform. I gotta gotta love with action. Like that means, that means whatever. It means if her love language is quality time to spend some time with her. I mean, I do need to tell her. You need to tell people you love them. Like, I don't know if you remember Archie Bunker, probably not a good illustration, but but, uh, if you're... If you're under 45, you never even heard of this guy, but, but it was an old grouchy, crotchety old man. And, and his wife said, Edith, she said, Archie, you never tell me you love me anymore. He said, I told you 45 years ago, and if it changes, I'll let you know. That, that's not what I'm talking about. But like I can tell, Micah's my, 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 my kid at home. Emily's still there. She's getting married in May. She's working all the time. I don't see much of her, but, but Micah's there all the time. And, and I can tell Micah I love him. But if I don't sit down with him and show him, and you, you know this, let me just remind you and listen to him. And boy, that joker can talk. I mean, he can talk. He went missing the other day. I couldn't find him. My first thought was, somebody took that boy. Now, my next thought is, no, they didn't, because they would have already brought him back by now. Like he would have talked their ears off. But if I don't sit down and, and play games with him and like figure all that, you know, them kids got like 15 fingers right now. They can do things with that remote control. I'm, just bring back a joystick, Brian, where we can just move it like this. What's up with all this mess? You weren't born for that. But if I don't try to figure, he's got this game he puts on your head and you look like you're in outer space and, it, and it, you don't care about all this, but I got to spend, you can't love with just, With just words, you gotta love with action. And Jesus, you know what Jesus did? He was tired, but he said, get up your mat, take it up and go home. I'll always have time for you. I'll make time for you. He he was in the middle of preaching, same chapter, Matthew chapter nine. He was talking about fasting. Again, they wouldn't let him rest. He's talking about answering questions. Why did John's disciples fast? Why don't you fast? He's right in the middle of it. Right in the middle of his lesson, while he was saying this, a ruler came and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died. The ruler's name was Jairus, maybe the most important man in the city. But come and put your hand on her and she will live. I, I, Jesus didn't say, Jairus, do you know what I'm doing right now? Like, you're interrupting me. I'm too busy. I, I'll go with you later. It, it's the story of we're talking about loving in action. We're talking about laying down our lives because Jesus laid down our life, his life. We're, we're talking about self-sacrificing love. We're talking about what does it mean to love God and love others. And, and the greatest example is the story of the Good Samaritan. 
And many of you know it. He's walking by this thug. Thugs had jumped out and beat this guy up. And, and a priest went by, he didn't have time. A Levite went by, he didn't have time. But the Samaritan, the most unlikely guy, because they were at odds with one another. There was a lot of racial tension between them. He stopped and he, and he bandaged the guy up and he put him on his horse and he took him to Holiday Inn and he checked him in and he laid down his visa card and said, hey, take care of his bill, whatever he needs. If there's anything else you need from me, let me know. I'll be back in a few days to check on him and, and I just want you to take care of him. And, 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 and that's what we're supposed to do. But my question is, how did he do that? We're so busy, we've got so much going on. I'll tell you how he did it. That Samaritan had created some margin in his life. And if we don't create margin, we're gonna miss a lot of opportunities. So I think that good Samaritan woke up that morning like he did every morning and said, God, if you can use anything, you can use me. Like, God, I'm going to walk slowly through the crowds. I'm going to put on the eyes of Christ. I'm going to see people as you see them. And I, I don't want people to be in an interruption, but an opportunity. opportunity. So, God, if you, if you send someone my way, I'll take the time. He had some time margin. You know what else he had? He had some financial margin. Somewhere along the line, he'd saved some money. wasn't maxed out uh, credit-wise. He, 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 didn't, he didn't use all he made. Because somebody had to have the money to pay for it. He had some financial margin. And he had some emotional margin. It, if you don't have it, you can't give it. I, I got a feeling that, that that good Samaritan was in tune with Christ, that he had spent time in his word, that, that he was a man of worship, that he had fed himself, that he had come to, to the temple to pray with other believers, and he'd been fed by the word that was taught to him. And so when he went out, there was something to give. He had emotional margin. And I'm telling you today, God wants to give us opportunity. God wants to send people our way. God wants to tap on our shoulder and say, you see that couple over there? They're struggling. They sure could use a friend. You've walked through a lot of the stuff they've walked through. They're a little younger than you. They could learn from your experience. I'd love to, God, but I just don't have any time margin. You know, we're so busy and we got so much going on. The sports, pet obedience school, we got everything going. We just, we just can't do it right now. Time margin. God taps on your shoulder. And there's a need over there. This guy's legit. He ain't worked in eight months. You need to be generous with him. Man, I'd love to, God, but you know we're so tapped out. American family about to debit my account. I ain't been there in 15 years, but, but it's going to take out that $109. I just don't have it right now, God. No finance. Are you hearing me? No financial margin. God taps on your shoulder. Hey, there's a need to be met. There's an opportunity to serve. The food bank needs people to help. The retirement community needs people to go and sing some songs. The, I don't know, you fill in the blank, whatever. The children's church, the, uh, the kids, Clover Hill kids need some people to, to serve as small groups leader. I love to, God, but I'm just so drained. I'm so weary, I'm so tired, I'm so weak. Amen. And we have no emotional margin. The Good Samaritan was able because he, he, had, he had made time. Jesus was able, and you know what he said? You know what he said? It's what he said. Jesus got up and he went with him and so did his disciples. On his way to Jerry, am I boring you? No. On his way to Jairus' house, the most important man in the city, another one woman comes up to him. And just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and said, touch the edge of his cloak. And she said to herself, if I can only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Yeah. But Jesus responded, I'm on my way to Jairus' house. He's the most important man in the city. I, I, you are not as important as he is. Here's sometimes what we do. God help us. I'll help someone who can do something for me later, but not for someone who will never be able to return the favor. We often help with our best interests in mind. I love the way the Pharisees described Jesus in Matthew chapter 22. They said, we know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. 
Jesus didn't see black or white, rich or poor. He didn't see Jew or Gentile. He didn't say American or Iranian. He sees souls that need salvation. He sees a woman, a boy or girl, a man without him is helpless or hopeless. He looks past the external and sees the heart of a man. He's not impressed with fancy titles or nice things because he, he came with an attitude, not with what you can do for me, but what can I do for you? Lord, help us to take on that attitude. And so when that woman interrupted him, he didn't turn her away. He didn't look at her with contempt. No, he looked at her with eyes of compassion and said, take heart, daughter. Your faith has healed you. You know what he's telling us? Let's not merely love each other with words, but let's show that we love each other with our actions. Finally, Jesus gets to Jairus' house and he raises his daughter from the dead. And and the Bible says as Jesus went out from there, two men followed him calling out, have mercy on me, son of David. Jesus didn't say, well, if I do this for you, I won't be seen. Nobody will even recognize I did it. There'll be no acknowledgement. There'll, There'll be no applause. There'll be no recognition. And I want us to fight that that issue and say, I don't care who sees what I do. I'm not even doing it for the approval of man. I'm doing it for the blessing of God. Men might not see it, but God sees it. And he sees the attitude and the motives of your actions. Paul tells us that whatever we do, do it for the glory of God, not man, but God. Not that you can get get a reward here, but so that you'll be rewarded in heaven with no fanfare, with no one knowing Jesus touched their eyes and said, according to you, your faith, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. How do I know that nobody saw him? Because later on in that verse, verse 30, it says, see that no one knows about this. Jesus healed the two blind men. He was leaving their house. While they were going out, a man who was demon possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And, And Jesus said, I've done enough. I've healed blind eyes, I healed a woman, I went to Jairus' house, I had a paralytic, I'm done. I've done my part, let somebody else help. The church I grew up in, there was a Sunday school teacher by the name of Mabel Everhart, remember her, Angie? Uh, 78 years old. She'd been teaching her Sunday school class for 50 years, had the biggest Sunday school class in in our church. 87 students came to listen to her. Every week, 78, 79 year old woman doing it for 50 years. She said, I'm not the smartest teacher. I'm not the greatest communicator, but every one of my students know I love them and pray for them on a regular basis. And she taught Sunday school right up until she went to heaven. Love, let us not love, let us not merely say that we love each other. Let us show us by our, by our actions. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. I don't, I don't, I I'm hope I'm communicating effectively. I want to communicate. I, I, I want to help you. I want to help me to love God and love people. And if we're going to do that, this is what we got to do. Dear children, let us not merely say we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. We can see people as an interruption or an opportunity. We can be too busy and miss out or we can take time to help someone in need. We can crave the applause of man or we can receive the applause of God. We can rest in what we've done in the past or with joy we we can continue to be used in the present and in the future. But if we're gonna obey the commandment of love, it requires action. It requires doing something. So here's, here's the two questions that, that I want to end with. Have you experienced God's love? Have you come to know him as your Lord and Savior? You can't give what you don't have. And you say, Pastor, well, you don't know what I've done, but I know what Jesus did. And he paid the ultimate price yeah, to save you, to deliver you. And your greatest problem is sin. And the only solution is Jesus. And if you'll give your life to Jesus, he'll forgive you. He'll walk with you. He, he's the God of the second chance. He's the God that's able to forgive, he, to forgive all your sins, to wash you completely clean. 
and to lead your life from this day forward? Have you experienced God's love? And then have you expressed God's love? Have you built some margin into your life where you can give financially, where you can show and help emotionally, where, where you can meet a physical need? Are we like the good Samaritans who wake up in the morning saying, God, if you can use anything, you can use me and keep my eyes open to my surroundings. And today, Lord, use me to be a word, give a word of encouragement, an offer of help to be a blessing. Have, have you experienced God's love? And are you expressing God's love? Amen, everybody. Stand with me, will you? And, and today with your heads bowed and your eyes shut, if, if you're not experienced the love of God, what do I do? Well, it just begins with a prayer. It just begins with a confession of sin and inviting him into your life. And let me just lead you in a prayer. You can say it right there where you're at. Don't even have to say it out loud. God sees your heart. He knows what's going on. Say, Lord Jesus, I, I realize today I need you. I need your forgiveness. I need your grace. I need your mercy working in me. And I ask today that you would forgive me of my sins. Just tell him, Lord, forgive me. I confess my sins. I agree with you concerning my sin, that it's wrong. And I confess it today. And I ask that you'll forgive me and cleanse me in Jesus' name. And today I invite you to be the Lord and the leader of my life. Here, here's, here's what I would say. I would just say, Lord, I give you my life. Lord, if you thought I was worth dying for, you're worth living for. And so I give you my life today. Take it and use it for your glory. If, if, if you're here today and, and you said that prayer and you made that commitment, look at me, will you? Let us know. Go by the new next steps right out in the back. And we want to put some resources in your hand. We want to connect you with other people. We, we want to move you along in your spiritual journey. We want, to, we want to spur you on towards love and good deeds. We, we want to help you in your new commitment to Christ. Let us help you. We'd love to. And now bow your heads once again. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, are, are you expressing love? God, I know there's times I'm not. and Forgive me for it. Lord, I'm selfish at times and self-centered at times. And God, I ask for your grace. Lord, I want to be your hands extended. I want to be your mouthpiece. And so today I'm reminded of the love that Jesus had and to, to model that and to follow that. Help us, Lord. Help us not to miss opportunity. In Jesus' name. We're going to worship the Lord in one more song. Will you not check out? Will you not uh, miss out mentally? Will you fix your eyes on Jesus one more time and let him seal what he has sown into your heart by his word? Let's worship the Lord together.